This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today, Daniel DiPiazza. He's the founder of Rich 20-something. I have to admit that takes some balls to put that out there as your brand. It's also the title of his first book, Rich 20-something. I love a guest like Daniel because he puts me back in time. I mean, let's face it, we're all marching forward in time. We're all getting older. But it's very productive to reach back and look at what different entrepreneurs are doing at different age points, different generations. I love the idea that Daniel, and I like to think I did this myself in my 20s, said enough. I want something more. I want to reach outside the box and bring home the bacon, so to speak. Because yes, we all want a little peace. We all want a little tranquility. But damn it, a little money helps. And coming from Venice Beach in sunny California, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Daniel DiPiazza. So Daniel, it's kind of a ballsy brand, rich 20 something. I'm sitting here with my, I'm sitting here as a 48 year old male who can remember launching his first website in 1996. And I, I could, I can remember very clearly. And so there's so much of going through your work. I just relate to completely, even though there's an age difference, because I feel like it's just, this is where everyone today should start. Everyone should start with the idea today that in their 20s, they're not just going to screw around. They're going to set something in motion. Because if you set something in motion, and I've seen this time and time again, if you set something in motion in your 20s, it is the absolute guaranteed best way to put the odds on your side to have something more, your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You don't set something in motion in your 20s, guess what? Your 70s aren't going to be so good. Now, a lot of people might not like to hear that, but that's the God's honest truth. That's how it works. That's that's life. You understood this instinctively inside your 20s. How did you start to understand that? Mm, That's a good question. I mean, listen, I I think that Rich 20-something in in its initial form, when I conceived it, wasn't really something that I took seriously. It didn't have a deep meaning. It was something that kind of sprang out of frustration, man. I mean, uh, I, I wasn't happy with where I was. I, I was at this weird place where I didn't know if I wanted to go back to school. It didn't really seem like there was anything left for me there. And I also didn't want to go in the corporate world. So I thought, all right, I need to, I need to try to find something that's going to work for me. And I worked these shit jobs and I, I was just really fed up. Rich 20 something came from the impetus for me to, to look for more. And it was more of a, of a, um, an, an aspirational title. I want to be one. Uh, not so much someone who was aware of the 20s being a very prime period, but just aware that I was looking for something a little bit deeper. This never stops being a challenge when I, when I observe people. So you knew that there was something wrong. Like you said, you're in the shit job. Everyone's been there. But most people don't get out of it. So you're in the shit job, and you start to say, gosh, I need something else. I need something else. What's that drive? Because the moment you decide you're in that place of working for someone else and you want to be something else, most people don't go along on that ride with you. You're, you're solo. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, uh, I remember I sit back in the restaurant on my break, you know, however long the break was. And I have these different, uh, magazines that I'd purchased from, uh, from uh, just the store, just Harvard business review, fast company, things like that. And I sit back there in the break room and I read these things and people would say, why are you reading that? What's the point? Like, you don't, why, why would you need to learn that stuff? You know, you're not in business school. Like what's, what's important about that, that stuff. And I used to think, well, these are the people who are not coming with me. Not everyone is going to, is going to be able to take an idea that they have build it into a huge business. But I think everyone has the capability to, to leave that job if they want to. Like, I, I, I think that you're right. Everyone has had that scenario at some point where they've felt trapped in a job, but I don't think that anyone is limited to, to that job because they're, because they're an experience because you start 
from there. You start from the very bottom. And I think that the main thing holding people back from that is just the realization that it is possible. It is possible to leave your job if you're unhappy. You don't have to keep doing that. And I try to communicate that through my, through my writing because a lot of the magic all in, in the resourcefulness and the ingenuity that people develop as entrepreneurs comes from just inexperience and trying things. That's the most important thing to realize and anyone can, can access that power. Let's dig into as much as we can flesh it out. Some things that, you know, we all say it, but how many people live it? Now, for example, you, you say quite clearly in your work, college is not all that. College is no guarantee of anything. And frankly, there might be better options than college. And, you know, I, I, I went ahead and was a, a C student in college. I got my MBA for one reason, to make my undergraduate grades look better. <laughs> how, how moronic of a reason is that for to go and spend two years getting an advanced degree? <laughs> and and that, speaks to, that speaks to how we think we are defined by the system versus what's the best opportunity for us. Let's talk about college for a moment. Right now, the headlines, and you know, you're you're a younger guy than me, but but old enough to see this this craziness these days. We have so many people uh, on college campuses, and I see specifically the millennial generation. And I'm not going to say all, but there's a certain subset that really, to me, as a, as a, as an outsider looking at the current college campus scene, it all, they almost seem like zoos in the sense that these are these are young people. That, that don't really know the way to go, and they're trapped inside these systems. And instead of instead of being curious and maybe thinking about the future, they're all caught up in these, you know, I could say something like safe spaces. They're all caught up in this kind of, uh, these arguments and debates that really don't mean anything because ultimately no one's going to take care of you except you. And so it's, I, let's talk about college. Let's tear this apart because I really Look, if you're going to go be an attorney, of course, yes, I understand. Doctor, yes, I understand. Engineer, I understand. And and I just read some great writing on the the power of a liberal arts degree. But damn it, everything that I've learned in the last 20 years, the only reason I've made any money, none of it has anything to do with what I learned in college. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is such a good point, man. I was talking to my girlfriend about this last night, and I... I was telling her how, you know, we think of our entire school career, you know, from age, I don't know, five or six in kindergarten all the way through the end of college, if you go, it's 22. And I think, man, it's essentially 20 years. I look back on what I've learned in traditional school, and I, I have a couple a couple thoughts. The first is, there are definitely a lot of fun times in school. Like, let's not deny that. Schools are, school can be very fun, and, and it is a good way to grow up and meet people and make friends. So there's nothing wrong with that. But I look back and I think about my experience And what I learned, and I think, man, you know, there was, I always felt like there was going to be some sort of like prize at the end of it. Like, uh, you know, I used to ask my teachers, what am I going to learn this, this piece of calculus? Or what am I going to need to know how to analyze a, a passage in this way? Their answer always seemed to be implicit. Like, you'll, don't worry, you'll need it. You'll need it. Don't worry. And I kept hoping that one day I would need this information that I'd been studying very, you know, assiduously. To this point, I haven't needed it. The basic things I've needed in, in my life have been, you know, a basic understanding of, of psychology, which, you know, is something that you can learn by yourself. Basic, basic arithmetic skills, you know, most of the machines that we use make most of our calculations, basic communication skills. And so I think that the, the time spent in school for me, just looking back on it, could have been much better spent learning something practical. Like if we're going to learn numbers, let's learn about how to actually balance a checkbook or we don't do checkbooks anymore, how to actually, you know, balance the bank account or how to invest. That would be useful to be teaching, you know, high schoolers, right? Investment strategies. Or if we're going to be teaching science, maybe it should be about the science, about the things we actually use around us every day. You know, or for instance, I look at my, my cell phone and I still have no fucking idea how it works. I really do not know. I have no idea. I have no idea what's going on with this thing. There are all these things we could be teaching, but all these things we're still teaching. We're still teaching things that are irrelevant to most of the students that are, that are being taught these things. We know that with computer science, every four years when a class graduates, the knowledge they have is now outdated. We know that more and more um, people are, continue, are, are encouraged to continue going to school, and we know that people get further and further in debt, and this has become a big problem to the point where, you know, lots of people are... It's a big business. It's a, it's a huge business, and it's very predatory, too, especially... I talked to my friends in Europe. They do not have this experience with with the predatory college experience of, of uh, banks and, and schools basically acting like 
drug dealers. And I mean, ima- imagine having imagine having a you know you're you're a 17 or 18 year old kid you're going to school and they're already asking you to, to to sign out loans and you don't know that you're going to owe these for the rest of your life. You don't think about that. And you know you might be. Fifty, sixty thousand dollars in debt before you can even have a drink. That issue right there, though, is really important because somehow or another, the the meme, the the way you're supposed to do things is to assemble all this debt. And you and I can sit here and have this conversation and 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 try to paint an alternate picture. But the vast majority of kids in college right now. They're still piling on this debt every day. I mean, that's just, for that system to stop. I, I don't see that it does stop. Oh no, no, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that it. W- it's definitely not going to stop. Um, it's like you know, it's like saying, that, uh, and this is another thing. Also, this is not. You know, we're not going to go into this, but like the whole fossil fuels thing. They will drain the earth until there's no oil left because that's what they're going to do. They're not going to. They're not going to let there be money in the ground that they're not going to drain. They're going to drain it. I think that's what's going to happen. So it's the same thing with the school, man. They're going to. They're going to keep running this system until it can clearly no longer work. And right now, you, they could have. Half of the people default on their loans, and they'd still make so much money off the rest of the people. It wouldn't matter. You know, you've got a great you've got a great line that I've seen you say. Uh, you, know, you talk about ROI, and mm-hmm. everyone knows what ROI is. But you've got the ROT, the return on your twenties. I hinted at this in the beginning of our conversation here a few minutes ago. My experience in looking at people that have done exceptionally well. I'm talking about the people that assemble the crazy fortunes. And and look. I don't really think anybody should set out to be a billionaire. The statistics of it just say that there's a hell of a lot of luck involved. But the the one part where there's not luck involved is earning money, significant money, early, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And there's, there's a lot of big reasons for this, but the math behind it is quite simple. It's the compounding. It's the extra time. So if somebody goes ahead and they spend... You know, they, they leave college, 22, let's say they spend 15 years in the corporate world getting a check, and they wake up in their mid-30s, and they want to now do something. People really need to think about that they are probably over 10 years behind, because that person that did not take that path, and at 23 said, I'm going to be the entrepreneur now. It is such a head start on the pure compounding, the math of making money. If you have more time, you can make more money. That simple idea completely out the window with the vast majority of the population. Totally, man. I mean, I think that's for and for, for many reasons. One is kids are staying home later now. So I have my, like I have friends of friends who are in their earlier 20s. So I would say anywhere from 23 to 26, which is kind of this weird period. Uh, because you're trying to, you're kind of transitioning from young twenties to late twenties. And I have a lot of people that I know who are that age who are still living at home, even up to like 26. And you got to think when you live at home in our culture, this is not global, but in our culture, staying at home that late is seen as stunted growth. We want to get you out there. We want to get you working. We want to get you in, in with the community. And a lot of times kids who stay home that late, they're not fully engaged. They're not going to be worried about becoming entrepreneurs or making money, they're not going to be thinking about much more than the day in front of them. And that's that's a mistake because when they do get out in the world and they're 27, 28, 29, now they have to start doing shit. And it might be the first time they've actually thought about taking care of themselves in their, their later years, their 30s, 40s, 50s. People might not like to hear this, but if you have a, an engaged 23-year-old that is taking entrepreneurial risk and trying something and bringing money in... That per that that person is light years ahead of the forty something that's never tried. Right. Well, to- totally. And look, man, I, I I would say I'm not even an example of that. I figured out that this was a possibility, you know, around twenty three, but I didn't really start to see any any cracks in the in the little in the armor until two thousand fifteen, and it's taken me a while to get to that point. And there are certainly people who are you know richer than me or whatever, but I think that one of the things that I've I've really brought to the forefront here is like. Just making people aware. Just be aware of what's around you. Like, be aware of the fact that if you're 23 or 22, ne- there is you have nothing to lose. You know, you literally have like eight free years where no one is going to hold you accountable for anything, pretty much. And so now would be your time to go out and just make as many mistakes as possible, figure things out without feeling a lot of guilt or without being stressed about the, the outcome. Because for the most part, you're going to be fine during those years. And I would just, I would, I would really bet on yourself. And you'd be surprised what you can accomplish in a short amount of time with the energy of a 20-year-old. Let's give people some technique. Let's get them into some ideas on taking that first step. I can recall being my last semester of grad school. 
I was in London and I was reading everything under the sun and somewhere along the line, I picked up and I'm sure there's gonna be people in the audience that will laugh. Now, I picked up Unlimited Power by Anthony Robbins. Oh, I read that. And there was that passage in there about Steven Spielberg going to the universal lot and he was just watching how movies were made and he simply wanted to get close to the action. And that, that simple story inspired me when I got back to the States to literally reach out to, very strategically, um, certain uh, fund managers that I wanted to talk to. And that simple piece of advice from a book has kept with me forever. And so I never, I never had, even though I was just a guy who had no experience, I didn't have any fear about reaching out to the, the superstars even, because I felt like, you know what? They put their pants on the same way. They had to get started. And maybe, just maybe, one of them, or two of them, or three of them, will like my initiative, appreciate my drive, and will give me some time. And I found out, I found out beyond a shadow of a doubt, not only did they give me time, 20 years later, many of these people have become my friends. They appear on my podcast. And it's just, it's an amazing thing to say that you can reach out to complete strangers. Now, and I want you to talk about this. That doesn't mean, you know, you, you do something weird or bombard them with emails or sound, or sound like some sad luck, sorry case that's pathetic. You've got to do something creative. Talk to that. I Talk to this idea of getting in, getting in line with successful folks. Yeah, I mean, it's really important. And I, I, you know, this is something that I think is so important because you don't really need to have a lot of, I would say these like high quality connections, you don't really need a lot of them to really change what's possible for you. Because when you align yourself with really successful people or some, and sometimes they can be successful or sometimes they're just very ambitious depending on what stage you're at. But when you align yourself with these rock stars and the, these high quality connections, good things start to happen because generally in their wake, if you just even just follow in their wake, there is people, you know, that are in line with them that you're going to meet that are high quality as well. And they're going to lead you to a lot of interesting things. You know, the first thing I'd say is the, the most interesting way is to be interested in someone. People love when they can just talk to you and be listened to without being interrupted. And I know that sounds really cliche and very, very over, overused and overrated. But look, if you look at master communicators, you look at someone like Bill Clinton, for instance, when he has a conversation with someone and he shakes their hand, and he looks them in their eye, he makes them feel like they're the only person in the world. And he's very attentive and he'll remember names and he'll be very, um, he'll be very astute in his observations and you feel very important to him. And when you look at guys who have a lot of charisma, this is a very common trait. So I think the first thing is you have to really be interested in people. You have to really like enjoy listening to them and enjoy what they have to say. Cause you're going to then pick up little details. that's going to make just a small little impression here and there mentioning their kids or mentioning a holiday that you remember that they celebrate, whatever. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, and of course, we're talking about connecting with influencers here, but these are all really good strategies. You got to be interesting. You got to have something to offer, man. As you mentioned that, though, to someone approaching you for mentorship, I always find that if you're wearing desperation on your face, it's very difficult to help someone. You can't be desperate. You just got to be, you, you got to figure out some confidence somehow or another before you've even made it. Correct. You're, you're totally correct. I mean, groveling as the first part of an interaction is not the best uh, way to set the tone or the pace. But I, I will also say that I think that, you know, these are like, I think that a lot of times young people don't know how to have like a, um, an interesting or a meaningful conversation. And that's something that you learn over time, but developing different skills or de developing different interests is going to allow you to connect with people at a, at a more, more, more effective rate. So, cause I think a lot of the people who are looking to align with these influencers just don't have a lot to offer. And so we have to work on ourselves. Let's talk about writing. Let me yeah. shift you into there for a moment. You have you're fairly prolific. I can see across the, uh, across the net uh, a lot of different associations with a lot of different publications, but you're writing and you're writing a lot and you're writing well. Speak to writing. I personally think, and I've seen you say this as well, I think everyone's got a book in them. But, you know, the idea of, I mean, look, I was a political science major with, with zero writing ability. I figured out how to do it. Who is not a writer today? I mean, here, here's the reality. Who is not a writer? I mean, you make a post on Facebook Instagram, whatever, you're, you're writing. I mean, unless you just post pictures, everyone's writing something. And so you can start with a, a half cute sentence that's not punctuated right or whatever. But the reality is 
everyone starts to see good writing. Mm-hmm. So everyone can say to themselves, oh, hey, I'm not a writer. I don't do that. Oh, come on, BS. You've, you, you have to do it today. Everyone's at least just a copywriter, <laughs> at least just someone who can pump out a headline because our life is, it really revolves around headlines. I mean, most of the news we get is in the form of little bite-sized headlines. We don't actually read the articles anymore. We Sometimes we do, but a lot of times we just go from headline to headline and we piece together the news. Everyone is, a, is at least a, you know, a mid-grade copywriter at this point. But I think that when it comes to writing as a craft, I think that there's a clear difference between someone who just has to write to communicate and someone who who tries to actively improve themselves in the craft. I consider myself to be uh, an actual writer. You, you know, I have a lot of... Uh, a lot how'd, of you get, how'd you get started in writing? Get, paint some picture for me. The, the early struggle, the shift, what was the spark for you? Well, I mean, th- look, I've been doing this for a long time, Michael. I uh, I started writing when I was a, a kid. I, my, my grandmother had this um, this old coat closet I would clear out my, her coats and I would set up the, the computer in there and I'd leave a little sign on the door taped that say, you know, do not stir writing in progress. And I was always fascinated with the fact that I could write something and it would create like either an emotional or an intellectual response in someone. That was always interesting to me. Like I could always express myself through writing better than speech because I felt like writing was just a very clear and precise form of thought. It's something that you could, it's an edited thought. And that's a very, that can be a very clean thing. And so I always enjoyed the process of writing. And as I got older, it just became something that I leaned on and it helped me through school. Um, it helped me to stand out as a student because I, I think because I was I always loved writing it, I was always pushed towards that. So I developed that, I think maybe a little bit lopsidedly with some of my other skills like math. So I just became more and more prone to rely on that until, you know, I went all the way through high school and college pretty much relying on that skill because it was very useful for me. And when I, when I left college, one of the reasons I was so upset was that I didn't have an opportunity to write as much, you know, and so I started writing movies. So I started doing some, some small, uh, short screenplays and I turned one into a, uh, screenplay that we shot. We raised money for it. This is, um, in my early twenties, it's like 21, 22. And that was a good experience, uh, both, both writing as a process and becoming a better writer experience a different, a different form of writing, and then also combining writing with business, which is something I didn't know would be useful later, but turned out to be very, very, uh, I guess, prophetic in that way. And so, so I do the movie, and we had fun. I actually was acting at the time. And so producing that movie as a shortcut made me a, a Screen Actors Guild actor. Like, I got my SAG card because I was able to produce my own movie, which is something I was looking for. So I, I kind of thought of myself as using writing, since I wrote my own movie, I, using writing as a tool to get what I wanted. So I was starting to see that it was useful. And then I, uh, I got into teaching the SAT and I got into all these things, all weaving my thread through writing until eventually I came to, you know, through my freelance businesses and all the way into starting this blog, which turned out to be a thing. I can't believe it was a thing. And so now, you know, my, I think I write it very seriously. We, I, I've written a book now, but I think that more than that, it's, it's the habit of writing. And I think that's what, that's where now as a writer I am, it's, it's, ha- it's, it's creating better habits around it. You didn't necessarily have a plan. You saw one opportunity and you took it. You took it. That opportunity presented another opportunity, not necessarily even in a straight line, and you took it. And and then and and so it's the idea, this kind of spider web off of taking opportunities. This back to our original part of this conversation. This is absolutely something that is not taught in college. College is college, high school, whatever you want to call it, is rote memorization. It's straight lines. It's linear. It's the stuff that you're talking about is never talked about. Never. I didn't even, I had to discover this thing. And I, I, I named this in my book. I named it nonlinear networking because I didn't know what else to call it. And it's something that I think this is one of the core things that sets me apart. And not sets me apart, it makes me better, but has differentiated my ability to be successful. Uh, because I recognize this, I think a few years earlier, or maybe in some cases, some of my peers still haven't recognized this yet, but this idea of, of leveraging the relationships around you. And I don't mean that in a manipulative or, a, you know, a malevolent way, but just more like looking at the cards that you have and playing your smartest hand. Uh, and especially when it comes to figuring out, um, the relationships around you and understanding that space, man, they don't teach that, but it is one of the most valuable skills, Michael. You are taking this step here, and step A is showing you this. Then all of a sudden, if you look off to the left, if step B that you weren't even considering 
appears instinctively, intuitively to you to have a higher degree of you know putting odds on your side, you take that step. You don't sit there and debate that you're stuck in A. If B looks better, you take it. Well, you know, look, I will say this, that, that method you described, it's, it's a very, um, there is definitely more risk in that method. And so that's why most people don't take it. I just be, be aware that. And, hmm, right? Homer, I don't think you, I don't think you really believe that. Well, okay. No, let me, let me clear. I don't think you really believe you don't believe there's more risk in that. You know, there's more opportunity in it. Cause that's why I'm talking to you. Well, okay. There's not, there's more risk in being the person that follows the damn rules. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll rephrase perceived risk. People are scared okay, of things that they don't that they that they're un, that are that are unknown. When you're when when you don't know things, you sometimes you can get blindsided and you have to learn. So that so there is there, there I would say I would say if not risk, there is more potential for growth down that route, and potential for growth growth isn't always uh, pleasant. That's what it is. The risk is is that the perfect straight line story that you were sold from six years of age until the end of college. The risk is. Oops, that might not work. And oops, you might be forced to do something else. And oops, you might have to take a loss. And the loss you're taking, the loss you're taking is the admission that you went down perhaps the wrong path. But you know what? So what? You make that admission, you adjust, you change, and you go a new direction. And the moment you go that new direction, what's the what's the internal feeling you have? It could range from elation to uncertainty, depending on you know who you are. But I can tell you one thing, you gotta ride that feeling through because it's gonna be good on the other side. You wake up each day and you say, okay, here's my venture, here's the direction I'm going, and you're you're doing what you think is the best step for each day, but you remain open to a new possibility which you know could appear at any moment and could change your life's direction at any moment. Again, that type of mentality is not something that's taught in traditional school. And people might say, well, why is it not taught in traditional school? Oh my God, how are you expecting a bunch of teachers on these campuses that went down the same damn path to somehow or another become these, these creative nonlinear geniuses? It doesn't work that way. We don't even learn of these inflection points in our lives. And sometimes they happen to us and we don't even know they're happening to us. This is what uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb talks about in his book, Anti-Fragile. And he talks about this anti-fragile and black swan. And these events are called black swans. And sometimes these big events happen to us. We don't know what's going on, but we know it's big. And we don't know how to take advantage of it. Um, or sometimes there are even smaller things, more subtle things that are happening that if we only had the perception to see that there were you know, good things happening, we could take advantage of those as well. We want to fully take advantage of these opportunities. We, so that's why we need to make better friends. That's why we need to learn how to navigate in the social space. And when you when you can learn that, you can take advantage of these this nonlinear networking that you're talking about, this these kind of these soft skills that aren't taught in college, these these invisible skills. It's kind of like this this invisible game being played around us. We can tune into that. And and then that's when the real game begins. Because that's that's when you get the invites to parties that were never advertised. That's when you get the you know the plane tickets and the points that you didn't have to pay for. That's when you get the connections to the editors that normally don't answer. That's how you get those things. And it's not, you know, you can either complain about it and you can say, oh well he's rich or he's you know, connected, or he's his dad is this, or whatever. You can say that, or you can say, look, you can just be honest and say, there's something I have. I have to learn these things. I don't know how to do these things, and I get that, and I'm going to work at it, and I'm going to I'm going to try to improve myself in this way. I love this subtitle: Ditch your average job, start an epic business, and score the life you want. If I would have been wise enough, I would have written that for myself at around age 22. I, <laughs> I like to th- I like to think that I've lived it. I, I, the last time I worked for somebody, I was 19 years old in Circuit City's warehouse, uh, uh, moving TVs around. So it's been a while. But the part I love about that ditch your average job, often this conversation comes up about, you know, ditch your average job. And I think, look, most people probably consider themselves in the quote average job. And, but you know, I often see this, uh, when, when the idea of a job comes up and leaving it and moving on to something else. I often see the advice given of like, you know, hold on to your day job. Mm-hmm. Here's the question. I, I don't get that one. I, if you hold on to your day job, I, look, there's an opportunity cost here, time value of money. If you hold on to your day job, you are committed, committing part of your brain, part of your time to doing something you don't like, you don't hate. This is affecting not only your physical time, it's affecting your emotions. It's affecting your ability to do something new. If you want to do something new, if you want to do something great, I don't know how the hell you're supposed to hold on to your day job when you're competing against the likes of all these folks up on Sand Hill Road and Silicon Valley or a Zuckerberg when he was 19. These people don't hedge it. I think that telling everybody they should hedge it 
if you hedge it, then you're by definition halfway. If you're halfway, how the hell can you pe compete against people that are doing it full way? It doesn't work. I know it's. I don't. I don't. I don't know your exact perspective on that. So I mean, look, you, you might you might hit me back, but so are, are you kind of talking about how you know, if I work a hundred hours and you only work fifty, I'm going to get double as much work done as you. That type of thing. No, what I mean is if you're if you, if somebody's in the average job right now and they're imagining as you know they're imagining being you. They want to they want to kind of go freelance, start their own thing. You know, get rid of the boss. They they want to be their own person. And a lot of people will say, well, okay, before you do that entrepreneurial venture, you know, hold on to the day job. Don't let go of, don't let go of the security. My point is, is like, I, I don't know how that works because the people that you're actually competing against the super successful, they don't hedge their bets. They jump in both feet into the deep end. I, I guess, I guess that's actually what it comes down to is the, the ability, the ability and willingness to jump in. But I do think that you can take small little baby steps to get yourself more comfortable with it. Like, yes, you can jump all the way in, but I think it's smart to take little dips in the pool first. And so that's why I like things like freelancing. You know, that's why I like things like getting a side hustle going first. And so, yeah, I think you are right. The people who are really successful are the ones who jump in head first, but you don't have to do it all at once. You can, you can, you can ratchet your income up. You know, you can start a side business. And what I always say is you start something on the side with a skill you have, keep it simple at first, do something that you can, provide for someone. But the, the, the goal is with your income, if you can make 60 to 70% of your, your day job income with your side hustle, then, then you can start, start to think, all right, well, I'm spending however many hours a week at my day job, 40 hours a week. The only reason that I'm not making my full-time income with my side business is that I'm devoting all this time to my day job. So then I see it as covering your main expenses. Now you can jump. And I, and I think that can be a smart way too. So you kind of like, you can go half foot in, half foot out until you're ready to go. And I think that you're just, you know, you're sitting there right now and you're like, oh man, Mike's too hardcore. About I mean, I just, I, you know what it is? I just have so, I just know so many students and I know what's right for them in terms of like, they're like, Daniel, I'm going to quit my job right now. I'm like, look, man, I did that, but it's more of like a do as I say, not as I do type situation. I did that. But I, I honestly think that for your own, for your own good, like, unless you really have something going for you, dude, like I don't demonize jobs. I actually sometimes envy people who have jobs because once you clock in for a lot of jobs, you're done after that. So like, I don't disrespect jobs. But what I do disrespect is you staying in a job that you hate. And if it's bothering you, then it bothers me. You can get out, but just, you know, you don't have to do it all at once. I've seen you use the, the phrase ruthless prioritization. And I think, you know, I'm, I, I have to admit, I, I'm probably not this great at it. I mean, I, I, I get by and I, I will, I will focus, but distraction has gotten so much worse. And I can't imagine being a teenager today. I mean, my God, you're being bombarded. I, as a teenager, I didn't, you know, it was, you know, a Kodak 110 camera. I mean, you weren't, you're I wasn't having to mess with this. yourself, Michael. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, well, I, I've got to, I'm being honest. I'm I just know. saying, I mean, I, I can remember pre and post internet, you know, I bet it, it's good. It, it's got to be really, really difficult, the distraction element, depending on your various age. But then again, even also people that are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, they're becoming addicted to this technology and addicted to the distraction. But that distraction is a, is a severe enemy uh, to growth and development. I disagree. I think, that, I think that I do write about ruthless prioritization in the book, and that's something that is important. Prioritization is important. But Outside of that, the distraction of social media, I think that we are, as a culture, evolving now. And I think that as a, as a I don't know if it's a species, that might be a little bit overkill, but like just as, as, a, as a culture, especially with the way that we've kind of began to evolve side by side with social media and we express ourselves uh, through that medium, I think that we just, especially these teenagers now, these kids growing up, they don't see it as a distraction. They see it as part of their lives. They, they don't see, when you have the, the pre-post-internet uh, comparison in your mind, it's going to seem very distracting. But to a lot of kids, it's just another way of talking. If anything, we're going to become more efficient with this, with the use of this uh, way of communicating. And anyone who resists it too much is going to be swept up and in, in, in kind of get lost eventually because we're going to do so much of our, of our, we're going to have so, so much of our community is going to be on that in the cloud, essentially. And I also think that this is a, this is a common, a common thing that happens from generation to generation is like, the generation going out is talking about how whatever the incoming generation is doing wrong, but eventually the, the things that they didn't like end up being the majority opinion, and they, it keeps rolling like that. So I think social media is definitely here to stay. I don't think it's as much of a distraction as we think. I, I think that it can be a powerful tool, and, 
and I still get plenty done. I'm, I'm on Facebook all the time, but I, I think that there's there's enough time in the day if you prioritize right. So social media. Okay, well, what, let, me, let me let me push back. Let me push back on you. What about the folks? And I, you see some of the big data on this: people spending six, eight, ten hours more, and you can even get into the gamers. Yeah, right, uh, right. But but there there are there are folks out there, unlike yourself, and you've got a, a pretty distinct view on things, and you kind of know where you're going. But there are folks out there that are being distracted in such a way where they're, you know, look, if you give six to eight hours a day of basically just banter or even more and just exchanging pictures, I mean, there's an opportunity cost here. It's one of the only things I learned in my, in my MBA program. But, you know, there is this opportunity cost. And if you do eight hours a day of exchanging back and forth, whatever, you're, you're not competing with Daniel. You're not starting a business. Right. That's that was my point of the distraction. It's really just a time value issue. Well, yeah. I mean, I see what you're saying, but I also think that, like, look, that that's less of an issue of that's kind of like blaming the gun for shooting someone. It's kind of like social media is just a tool, and people who are really super distracted by it. Um, not that it isn't. It is distracting in, innately, but the people who can't get their lives under control because they're so distracted, that says something deeper about what's going on with them rather than social media being the culprit. It's like, well, social media is a tool they're using to distract themselves, but what's oh, going point, on with them? Fair point, fair point, fair point. I mean, and, and look, that, that probably gets back to a subject that you and I could talk about for hours, which is the, the personal psychology of today's man and woman. You've got this book coming out, Rich 20-something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What am I going to do? You're excited, yeah? Well, they keep asking, what are you going to do when you're 30? What are you going to do when you're 30? Well, I, you know what? I guess I'll have to write another book. <laughs> Richer 30-something. <laughs> well, wealthy and smart 30-something. <laughs> you know, actually, I've been giving some thought to to that um, transition. Actually, now people keep it. They really do keep asking me, what are you going to do? Because I'm going to be 29 in a few weeks here. And what are you going to do? You know, you're coming up on your last days of your 20s. And I say, guys, just because I have a, my company is called Rich 20-something doesn't mean that as I grow older, I can't still help this market of people. I'm obviously very passionate about it. You know, so it's, I think it's fine. One of the things that, that this book has in spades is it's, it's realness. It's kind of raw. And I talk about things that really happened to me and you get to learn a lot, you know, about what it takes behind the scenes of a business. I wish I would have had this type of book to connect with when I was on my journey, because it would have been something that, um, that would have helped me along the way. And I think there's a lot of people out there who are just getting their feet wet and they want to both have some actionable strategies to get started, plus some really good ideas of what it's going to actually do to your life. I think they want to know both of those things. And this book includes both of those. And look, even though we are, we're using the phrase 20 something, uh, having gone through the book, uh, the insights, the things that you're covering, uh, this is, uh, not dependent on age in the sense that if, you know, can you, can you get something from the work at, at 50, 60, uh, at 15? Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. And you know, look, we have people in our community that all the way from their, you know, the early teens into their sixties and the seventies sometimes. Um, so that that's, I think that's the one drawback of, of the name of the book and of the brand in general is that it's very, um, specific to who it serves on the outside. But I also think that there are a lot of people out there who see 20 something and think of that in the context of, how they feel and how old they actually are. And in that case, we have lots of people who are all different age ranges and they know that basically all we're talking about is how to make your life better, you know, how to make more money and be a little bit happier. I'm always going to be aligned with anybody that takes the chance and figures out a way. And there's always another way to figure out another chance, but anybody that takes that chance to figure out a way to make some money independent of the system, I'm always going to feel alignment, even if we don't cross paths personally for some time to come. So anyways, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, hey, Daniel, where's the best place that everybody can, you know, book available and all the major bookstores and all that kind of fun stuff? Best website. Oh, simple, man. It's uh, rich20 something, rich, R I C H 2020, then something.com slash forward slash book. Daniel, thank you for time today. Pleasure, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right Trend Following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, 
trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.